Welcome into the Original Gangsters Podcast. I am your host, Scott Bernstein. Today, we are having another killer crossover edition with the Sit Down Podcast. Jeff Nadu of Barstool Sports. Uh, he is a man of many talents, a, a diversely skilled individual, just as good at uh, p- uh, picking college basketball games uh, as, a, as a pro tout than he is breaking down uh, organized crime. And uh, we've kind of built this, uh, you know, the Avengers squad or, you know, the Justice League of, uh, if, if we're going to compare it to the, to the uh, comic books, but combining forces and and uh, tackling uh, OC in America. Jeff, thanks for coming aboard again. Always good to come on, Scott. I always, uh, I always am happy when you ask me to come on or we kind of are able to work together. We always seem like we uh, put out some great content. So happy yeah. to be back. There's a lot going on as, as usual in the world of crime. Yeah, we're both really passionate about, I think, anything we do, but especially this stuff. And um, Jimmy, uh, my my normal uh, co-host, the doctor, Jimmy Bucciolato, uh, is off for the week. And uh, Jeff was, was kind enough to, I mean, he would have jumped on with us if Jimmy was here anyway, but uh, it was kind enough to, to jump on and kind of co-host, co-host this with me. Uh, I want to do this episode uh, I always try to thread that needle between what's going on today and tying it into maybe some interesting history. Uh, so we've been talking a lot about uh, Mikey, the nose man, Cuso, the boss of the Bonanno crime family in New York lately. Uh, it started, you know, in the New York press uh, in the summer with a internal dispute that led to a funeral parlor brawl. I've been reporting um, over the last couple months that he's stalking his former acting boss, uh, looking to kill him. There was a shooting in Long Island back in December, yada, yada, yada. We don't need to, um, you know, beat that dead horse. It's been reported. We've talked about it, but Jeff did a, a, a great interview in the last week or two, uh, with a new member of kind of the YouTube, uh, content OC world. Uh, Dom Sicali, who was a high-ranking member of the Bananos, a right-hand emissary, best friend of uh, of Vinny Gorgeous Bastiano, um, and was working directly with Mikey Mancuso uh, in the early to mid-2000s. And Dom has started a YouTube channel, and one of the first pieces of content that he rolled out, I think it might have been the first piece of content, We had known about this feud that had developed between Mikey Mancuso and Vinny Bastiano. Bastiano was kind of fashioned himself the new John Gotti in the 2000s. And um, when he got locked up, he named Mancuso his acting boss. And there was some tension. We didn't really know the specifics of it. Dom C. Cali really added a lot of color and told us that there was a a murder contract that was supposed to be executed on Valentine's Day 2005 uh, would have been New York's version of the Valentine's Day massacre and uh, never got carried out because C. Cali was taken off the streets. Eventually, he he turned cooperator. Um, so, Jeff, you interviewed him last week. I kind of want to deep dive this Mancuso Bassiano feud uh, that might have short-circuited Mancuso's rise to boss before it even started. So talk about that interview. And I know you didn't talk about that specifically, but just talk about getting a feel yeah, for, for Dom. I, I think the most glaring thing I've noticed with, with Dominic is there's no love lost between him and uh, Michael. Um, and that's been kind of – anytime you hear Dom discuss uh, the Bananos, he always seems to try to find and add – Mancuso back into it. Um, from what I know and what I've learned, Dom actually wrote a book uh, with Ed Scarpo several years ago. Uh, and in the book, he actually talks about how at one point, Michael kind of made it clear you know, he didn't really want to take orders from Dom when Vincent gets locked up because um, that was kind of the, the goal. Chicali told me in the interview that he never really wanted to be made. He didn't have a dream to be made, um, but Vinny really pushed for it because he liked Dom. He trusted Dom. And if Dom uh, had to be the 
the kind of the actor for him on the street. He was, you know, he could kind of believe in that he could do it. Uh, and it was clear that Michael was a power tripping lunatic, didn't want to take orders from anyone. Um, and, you know, there's definitely some ardent beat between the two, um, which is still there today. I mean, he badmouths him any chance he gets. Um, and, you know, there's clearly no love lost. Uh, but yeah, he could have. And I think, if, as, as you know, I think it would probably have been a better idea if it would have happened for the Bonanno crime family because they would have had a lot more steady leadership um, in a Joe Camerano or Vinny Badalamenti or whoever is the boss. Um, I think it's pretty clear that Michael Mancuso is uh, a real liability. And what's interesting is that Bassiano is the one who opened the door for Mikey Mancuso to become an acting capo and then to become acting boss. Um, so, yeah, you know, Scott, I wanted to kind of point that out as well. I mean, Dom essentially kind of foreshadowed that Vinny was the guy that kind of, and, and I think this would have been Dom's position if Dom wouldn't have cooperated and, and was on the street, it would have been him instead of Mancuso. And he just had to kind of go with Mancuso because that's who he was on the street. You know, John Sparito was in jail. There's a couple of other guys in jail that he would have probably elevated over, um, over him. But Dom almost foreshadowed that Vinny still somewhat controls them in a way. I, I, I don't think he was actually saying that, but would it surprise you at all if, you know, Dom is, or if uh, Mancuso is still going to Vinny on certain things? It wouldn't surprise well, I me. Think, I actually think having some better understanding of what was going on between them. And I, it's, it's an interesting question to ask about how much sway Bastiano still holds from behind bars. He definitely um, seems to be taking this life sentence in stride, as opposed to a lot of these gangsters where you see pictures coming out uh, from behind bars where they're snarling or, they look, they've lost a lot of weight or they've gained a lot of weight or they've lost their hair, or their hair's gone gray. Uh, pictures have, have come out over the last handful of years of, of Vinny and he looks like a million bucks. He he's really tan, does. He's smiling. He seems to have made connections with a lot I, of I different. Think, I think the thing that I've learned about Vincent Bacciano, you know, obviously I don't know him personally, but he does seem to command a room. He's just a born leader, it seems like. Yeah. Um, he has a lot of swagger, a lot of, um, and, and from what Sakali talked about, I mean, he was a very personal guy. People liked him. He joked around. He had a good time. Um, I think he was just likable around a lot of people. And, you know, again, I think he had a real problem because as we know, and as you know, the Bonanno family in the 2000s was really pummeled, quite honestly. I mean, most of them went to prison. I've said before, I think Sal Vitale is the most destructive witness of all time uh, due to the fact of who he put away. I mean, every single person at a high level in the Bonanno crime family, either cooperated or went to prison. So when yeah, and if you're and if you're playing the Monday morning quarterback game, and this this came in this came into the court record from 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 Don Chicali's testimony, Messina was being told by Bastiano and other people, kill your brother-in-law, kill your underboss, Sal Vital. And I think that was Messino's plan. And it just either there wasn't a uh, time sensitivity and they thought they could wait a little bit uh, longer to, to rock him to bed or, or I think it was something that they were going to do, but never got a chance to do. And if they would have acted quicker to your point, it, it might've not led to the domino effect that it did. Yeah. According to some of the testimony of, of Chikali, there were three people at one point that they were soliciting to kill uh, a, a girlfriend um, an individual who slapped Chicali's, I believe, father or uncle and Sal Vitale. Right. Um, and, and that's something that we continue to learn. I mean, so there were a lot of people that hated Sal Vitale. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't want him in power. I know Tony Urso hated Sal Vitale and, and, and Sal Vitale hated Tony Urso. Um, there was a lot of issue between them. Um, I don't think anyone quite respected Sal. I'm sure there were a few, but not many. But yeah, I, I've learned a lot in, in you sent me the testimony and reading it because Dom's a guy that kind of disappeared for a while and we didn't hear from him for a long time. And then he's kind of popped up out of nowhere. And I'll tell you, he's a really interesting character. Um, he's colorful for sure. Um, I think he's going to have a really good channel um, as long as he just kind of stays on task. But yeah, he definitely doesn't like Michael. Uh, but I again, I'll ask you, Scott, who do you put in as boss? I mean, everybody was off the street. so Right. 
Well, and I think people said that. And even, frankly, for Vinny, and uh, he rose fast in terms of uh, from, from capo to acting boss. Uh, I think that Chicali is an interesting case study in 20, uh, 21st century you know, mafia, the early 21st century when you're talking yeah. about the mafia and the difference between how it was even maybe 10 years before that, but definitely 30, 40, 50 years before that. And then what was going on from, you know, let's say the 2000s or late 90s till today, where a guy like Chicali was someone probably in an earlier era would have been made earlier, but he didn't, he didn't want the button. He was connected to a lot of different people and a lot of different families. He was very capable. Um, he had a lot of respect and, and had some um, versatility in what he could do in terms of being an earner and being a hitter. Uh, and I, I didn't know. I've, I've learned a lot of this more recently. I always, I always knew he was connected to Bastiano, but what I've learned is that he his his entree uh, to the Bananos came through Anthony and Delicato, Bruno and Delicato, who yep. he met and became friends with when he was serving a, a prison sentence for uh, drug dealing and, and a second degree murder. Of which he today still says he was set up on. Yeah, uh, he is and he got set up by a, Gen a Genovese associate who was a drug dealer for years. Right, or right, a Genovese soldier that was a, a, a drug yeah. dealer. Um, now, but, you know, uh, go ahead, sorry, Jeff. Real quick, that's that's kind of something I wanted to bring up, and and that's a good point by you. You know, he he was around some big people, Dom. I mean, so I, really, I think I, I think like the a big winner of the of the uh, of the mafia for a while in terms of who he was running into and when he was running into them. The, the big winner, I think, in all of this and looking at the testimony is Muscarella in the Genovese, is who was had the wherewithal to say, you know what, yeah. go ahead, go hang with the Bananos. Because now you look what would happen. The, the whole hierarchy of the Genovese crime family could have been kaput yeah. if he hangs around. Well, the so. Bonanos also are just talking about case studies and, you know, where, where I where my interest in research gravitates to the most dysfunctional group. Uh, you know, here in, in Detroit, my home base, they're, they're like this picture of functionality over the years, which is great. You can chronicle it like a couple times, but it's it's so functional that it it uh, it it kind of undermines reporting. So when you get a, a family like the Bananos, um, they're just the roller coaster of that family, starting back in the '60s with Joe Bonanno and he, what he had tried to do, moving into the '70s with uh, Carmine Galante, uh, then you know with the Donnie Brasco thing and the family basically being not basically they were kicked out of the commission. They were a outsider in some ways for a while. Joe Messino rises and takes the family literally from the basement to the penthouse. And by the late nineties, they're kind of the, the cream of the crop uh, right. when it, when it comes to, to the, to the mafia. And then it all falls apart again when, when Messino becomes the first ever a godfather in New York to, to, to turn government. Look, I get Joey Messino cooperated. We all know that, but we have to look at as a boss, and you and I and RJ had a conversation about this a while ago. As a boss, he was very effective, right? Incredibly he took effective. him through a lot of uh, rough waters, got him out to the other side. There were, and I, the I, family. I, I still reference back to that old wiretap involving a Baldi Longo and the Genovese family who said, you know, he was talking to Cookie D'Urso, and he said, there are two families that run New York, this family and Joe's family. And that was at the height of, and that was after the Gotti regime had kind of ended and they were strong, you know, and, and, and all of a sudden it just fell apart uh, and Vitaly did what he did. And, you know, I, I think, um, you know, obviously you're right. They're, they're kind of a picture of, of highs and, and a lot of lows too. And Messino just made, you know, I agree with you. I think it's hard to dismiss the fact that he became the first ever New York Godfather to, co to cooperate, but putting that aside, his, 15 or 15 to 20 year run as boss goes down, you know, in my opinion, is one of the all time great, you know, godfather tenures 
in, in the five the history of the five families, uh, and, and especially when you consider that he had to build that family back, you know, from the ashes. And he made a couple, and this is just, I think this is just, this is history. This is what happens, you know, the, the kind of, I call it the fine line theory. Uh, uh, there's such a huge, or there's a small difference between what ends up being, you know, these these huge differences in, in the way that, that fate, uh, you know, twirls in whatever direction. And, you know, with Messino, he made a couple fatal flaws uh, late in his, uh, late in his run. And, and they came back to bite him uh, in terms of his brother-in-law and his underboss. And then really, you know, he, the and then this brings us back to Bastiano Mancuso. Um, Bastiano and and Chicali and Chicali as well. That they they went. Bastiano went from a mid level player in the family to a major player in the family in a short period of time. And Chicali went from someone that didn't have a button to somebody that before he even had his button was running with the biggest players in the family. Got his button and was practically the underboss of the family within a year. Well, whether it was in name or in the way that the, the family was being run. I think the one problem, and, and Chicali talked about this in, in kind of some of the negative aspects of Joey Messino, is he elevated a lot of people that were not cut out for the positions that they had, right? So, you know, bringing in people that probably didn't need to be made, but he just made them to make them, um, you know, elevating people that, you know, probably shouldn't have been in the positions they were in, you know, certain uh, captains and people like that. And, you know, I think ultimately that could have cost them too. Um, but yeah, it, it's, um, it, it's amazing in the 2000s how quick some of those guys elevated. Right. But they had to, because it was, it was a you know, sign of the sign of the times. I mean, you look at all the, the rats they had, whether it was Copa or Tartaglione or Vitali or, 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 or Cantarella. I mean, they had a, a hitter after hitter cooperate. You know, and it's the, the people that came out on the other side, right? I mean, that's why I'll continue to say, Scott, and I'm curious what you think. I mean, obviously, I know Sammy Gravano was a destructive witness and Michael Scars and, and all these other guys. But when you're looking at sentences, what people got, you look at Vitali, 24 uh, defendants got 20 or more years because of Vitali. He put like 55 people away in different families. That's yeah. a lot. That's a high percentage. Um, he was really brutal for the mob and, and you know, was very effective. He earned his uh, cooperation. So let's let's kind of go back and give some uh, backstory on, on Bastiano Mancuso. Uh, Mancuso uh, and Bastiano both have roots in the Bronx. Uh, Mancuso, they all do. Comes, yeah. right, Mancuso comes from the old Purple Gang, uh, which was the East Harlem... Bronx kind of I don't I, I think saying JV mob is actually not doing them I think they're more justice always, they were more of a drug gang slash hit squad that happened to have them a like, lot of guys uh, that became big time mobsters I look at them more as a farm team I mean I think they're very similar yeah. to like the Giannini crew a lot of Giannini kids became uh you know whether it's Guzzo or or Pipitone they all became made guys um yeah I, I think they're a, a farm team you know yeah in, but in Mancuso the, was According to the government, now he's a two-time convicted murderer. Um, one was a, a, a second degree with his wife. Um, another one was related to something we'll talk about in a second uh, with, with Vinny Bastiano. Um, but according to the government, he, he made his bones in the 70s and uh, was responsible for quite a few hits uh, during his time as a purple ganger. And then uh, went to prison for the, the death of his wife, which happened in an argument, um, and he dropped her off at the hospital, uh, went and did, I think, 12 years, 14 years or so, I think it was 12 years, came out in the mid-90s and got a button. Uh, Bastiano goes all the way back to the, to the three capos. Uh, that you saw in Donnie Brasco. He, he was, was a young a young guy that was coming up under Big Trini, uh, Dom Trinquera. The guy, if you see Donnie Brasco, it was the big, big, fat one that they had trouble killing because he was so big. That was Vinny Bastiano. Do you know uh, how you got connected with Trinquera? No, tell me. 
there's an old story that as a child, he essentially helped a young kid in the neighborhood that was being bullied. And it was someone related to Chinchera. Uh, and, you know, Bastiano is interesting because you know, he had a lot of business, man, whether it was legal yeah. or illegal. And, you know, you look at how he kind of established himself in the bookmaking trade, the numbers trade. He allegedly killed his mentor, Tony Cole Colangelo, right. threw his body in a on the side of a road and took it over. He was supposed to give money to the guy's wife and just said, you know what? He's gone. I'm not doing it. He comes home, just whacks the kid or the guy. So, yeah, he but he was a smart guy. He took a lot of his money, put it into hair salons and blimpy restaurants and all these different things. Got a ton of real estate. He he was a big drug dealer as well, Bashiano. And I think that's where him and Mancuso, I'm sure, kind of connected a little bit. They were both part of that Bronx crew uh, that was run by the D. Filippos. Um, yeah. So Vinny is in with the major players in the Bonanno family at a very young age. That's how he meets Bruno Indelicato, uh, who was the son of the leader of that three capos faction, Sonny Red. And Delicato, uh, Bruno was known as nutty, you know, as a guy that uh, was quick tempered, had a lot of ambition, had a drug problem and uh, liked to throw his weight around. He was involved in the notorious assassination of Carmine Galante at a very young age. There's video of him, surveillance video of him in the hours after that being congratulated uh, by Neil De La Croce. Um, he was in his mid twenties at that point. Got up to capo status at that point. Was one of the youngest capos in all of New York City. So Bastiano, you know, kind of—I don't want to say hitches his trailer, but because that again, that's kind of does a disservice to Bastiano. But very early on, when he's in his twenties, he's aligned with people that are either have reached the highest levels of the family or are being fast tracked towards that, and. Um, that brings us into the 90s where Chicali meets Bruno, who's in prison. Bruno and Delicato was in prison for the Galante assassination and meets Chicali. And when they get out, it's interesting if you read his testimony, um, he goes and meets in Delicato and Bastiano. It's the first time he's meeting Bastiano. Uh, in, I think it was in 99. They had both got out of prison. And it was just kind of like a say, like say hi to each other. If you need anything, give me a shout. And then a couple days later, just fate brings them together at Rayo's, the famous uh, Italian restaurant in Harlem. And that sparks this relationship that starts between him and Indelicato and then eventually becomes him and Bastiano and he gets very close to Bastiano. Um, he is not allowed to be made right away because he had a drug conviction. Mass Massino didn't want, wanted anybody that had a drug conviction to wait at least, I think, uh, six years, five, six years. So Mancuso gets made uh, when he first comes out of prison, but but uh, Chicali isn't made until, I think, 2003. Correct. And Bastiano becomes capo of the Bronx crew, and as Massino's going away, before he flips or before anybody knows he flips, Bastiano kind of forces his way into the acting capo spot. I mean, he gets the approval of, eventually gets the approval of Messino, but it, it looks like he, it was almost retroactive. Like he assigned him, I'm the boss, and then, but now I'm going to go make sure it's okay with Joe Messino. And Joe Messino says it's okay. So now I'm officially the boss. When he also was in the Bronx, which one of the reasons Patty from the Bronx is made a capo is because Joe Messino says, we have nobody in the Bronx as a capo. Yeah. We're going to make Patty the guy up there. Patty, Patty goes away in the George Canada thing, and right. they have a power vacuum there. And I think he kind of just assumes and says, which hey, according George to Messino, the George, the Can George from Canada thing, according to Messino, Mikey Mancuso played a role in, in the, the George from Canada murder in 1999. I just think, you know, he kind of said, hey, I'm going to take the bull by the horn. It's not like Joe's coming up here anyway. He's a Queens guy. It's more Brooklyn and Queens with them. So I'll just kind of, you know, I'm, I'm kind of the next in line here, you know. And I think he was right because he was close with Patty and, and Patty was gone. So he probably would have been named acting capo anyway. And then he kind of makes his way to 
that ruling body, right? He's at the table when Tony Urso starts talking about let's kill those rats families. Yeah. And, you know, he kind when of. When Urso goes away, Bassiano kind of names himself the replacement and then goes to Joe Messino or uses an intermediary to go to Joe Messino. And there was some type of code. And he says to the person to tell Joe Messino to come back with, you know, 719 if it's okay for me to be boss. And the number came back 719. And I believe then... they used to coordinate stuff through a Pringles can. That's okay. that's what I that's what I know. And they used to use this lawyer. I believe his name was Tony Lee. I believe his name was. Yes, T- uh, Tommy, got... Tom, Tommy Lee. Tommy Lee, right. Tommy Lee. Yeah, he got uh, jammed up for, for kind of being involved with all that. So Bassiano goes from Capo of the Bronx crew to acting boss for Joe Messino. At this time, he names Mikey Mancuso Capo, his his replacement as Capo of the Bronx crew. Uh, Vinny lasts a year on the street. It seemed like what he was doing um, in terms of uh, circling the wagons and, and getting kind of the... I think Messino at that this point is locked up and they don't know, people don't know that he's flipped, but there was kind of a morale, a lowering of morale around the family. Vinny kind of injects some energy, changes some of the protocol. I know that he was, um, he was eager to bring back the traditional making ceremony. He felt like it had lost its uh, meaning because Messino was so worried about uh, someone, you know, a raid that they would find the gun and the knife. So it was more of like, uh, you've come here today and you're a made guy and I'll go home. Mm-hmm. And Vinny wanted it to be very, uh, pa- a lot of pageantry and, 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 that, and that endeared him to a lot of people. But then Vinny gets locked up and this is where the problems start to happen. So he names Mancuso as acting boss and Chicali becomes capo of that crew, but is the man that's relaying messages between Bastiano in prison and Mancuso on the street. And very quickly, they start to butt heads. And Mancuso does, like you mentioned earlier, doesn't want to take orders from Chicali, even though the orders are coming from Bastiano. And what's more important to Bastiano and who made more money? Dom, right? So Dom's always going to be indebted. You know, Dom's always going to be the guy, you know, hey, where's my envelope? And Dom talked about that. He said that's one of the reasons he cooperated. He said they... He'd given all this money to them and, and they still, you know, weren't willing to, to help him out. But yeah, I think Mancuso kind of in a weird way kind of was cut from the same cloth with Bastiano where he wanted to be in charge. Uh, he was made to be in charge. So why wasn't he making decisions? Uh, he had to go through Chicali. He didn't like that. Uh, and I think he kind of uh, envied him in a, in a way. And then the Pozzola thing happens, which. Right. So let's, in, well, know. I think first the Santoro thing happens and right. then the Pozzola thing. So let's go, let's let. You know, if people don't know, let's fill them in. Yeah. Uh, so it, around the same time period, uh, early 2000s and mid 2000s, uh, Frank Santoro was a a junkie, basically, that had gotten into some beef with Vinny Bastiano's kid and threatened to murder Vinny's kid or kidnap Vinny's kid. Vinny wanted to make an example out of him. And what's interesting to me is Vinny's, I believe he was a capo, if not a cop. Uh, or he wasn't acting boss yet. I believe he was a capo at that point. And he wants to go out and do this hit himself. And him and Cali and Anthony and Delicato go out uh, and they go find Frank Santoro and they, they lay on him and then they eventually get him walking his dog. Uh, then Vinny Bastiano gets locked up. And Mancuso was involved in that as well, by the way. I'm not exactly sure how, but he's. Well, well, remember though, they had a, a they they originally were going to hit him at one point, and it didn't go down. And right. Delicato wasn't there the second time around, and Anthony Donato was there, right? And they Sorry. shot yeah. him in a in like a park with his dog because Chicali's father kind of fed them information that hey, he walked well, bad information. That he he yeah. said he was living in uh, Pelham, Pelham Bay, Bay. Yeah. and he was actually living Throgs, uh, right, in Throgs Night. Yeah, and they spot him, and then they find him in this park, and that was that. Um, and then there's the Randy Pozzolo hit, which, you know, Vinny was, wanted to make examples of people uh, early in his regime and kind of set a tone 
Um, who knows what would have happened uh, if he had allowed to have a longer run and had been free for longer, if how that would have played out. But Pizzola was this w- wannabe, uh, a guy that was very eager to, to get a button, a guy that had a short temper and liked to brag and boast. And um, eventually they brought him in close to them because they thought they could control him. And but they knew that he was kind of crazy. And then he starts getting drunk and shooting his mouth off that he know, you know, that he knows how to run the family better than the guys that are running the family. He knows how to do murders better than the guys. That he also said he was the only killer in the family. Right. And um, he was also doing some uh, construction work on Bastiano's house and yeah. it bit off a little more than he could chew in terms of. Uh, craftsmanship when Bashiana talked about it he said that, you know he acts stupid all the time he's always acting right. stupid he's a liability so he orders both of those hits without Messino's uh approval even though Messino at that point had he had flipped I I believe at least by the Pozzolo time he had flipped um but in traditional protocol Bastiano was supposed to clear that with with Massino. The first one, Santoro, he says to him, well, I needed to do it because this guy was threatening to kidnap my kid. It could have happened any second. I had to act immediately. Uh, With Pozzoli, he just says the kid needed needed to eat a bullet, and this is going to put a scare in everybody. And trust me, I know what I'm doing. But it was retroactive. Right, and that's where they... And Joe Massino was taping him. Right, and that's where they use, you know, the young kid, Ace, who right. was ALO. ALO. Yeah, who, you know, was the son of a guy, a drug dealer from Queens, R- Ridgewood kid, Giannini kid. You know, he's kind of a free agent and he kind of slots in with, with them and he does the hit alongside uh several others. So and so that was Mancuso, that to get him in Greenpoint. So Mancuso is refusing to take orders from Bastiano. See Chicali's saying that is telling Bastiano that he'll take orders when it comes to money and business, but he will not take orders when it comes to um, personnel, you know, where guys are, are being situated, who's being promoted to what there was an incident with, with uh, Louis De Chico, Louis electric, where Bastiano wanted him up to Capo and Cali comes and tells Mancuso and Man- Mancuso basically I won't make them until Massino tells me I can make them. A lot of confusion. Right. And and there actually came to a point where Chicali brings Louis Electric to Mancuso and says, I am naming him a capo. Mancuso con- shakes his hand, says, congratulations, but it's still not official. I got to check with my people. Uh, and and Chicali is telling Bastiano in prison through intermediaries that he feels like a sitting duck that he feels Mancuso is going to move on him, push Bastion out of power, kill Chicali, and take over the whole family for himself, which he eventually does in 2013. But the belief was that they were going to, that he was going to do it in 2005. And, and that whole, leads us to this assassination attempt that never The gets whole thing is, I'm going to get to him before he gets to me, yeah. which Joey Messino did in years before with, with, with the three Capos thing. So, yeah, that's the thing. It's kill or be killed. You know, you got to take care of him before he takes care of you. You know, it's pretty simple. So the plan was to get him on Valentine's Day, uh, February 14, 2005. They'd started to plan it in, uh, I think, around Christmas, early January. Chicali gets picked up, I think, in late January, and it never goes off. But the, um, the plan was to get him coming out of his girlfriend's house, who, who also kind of plays into some stuff that's been going on in, uh, in the last decade or so, my politics wise, Mancuso was with the uh, ex-wife or uh, of a Lucchese soldier named Joey Relay. And um, Mancuso ended up eventually getting into kind of a love triangle with a former Purple Gang friend of his, Michael Melvish. Yeah, he has and, a lot of uh, issues with women. Yeah, so 
this is the woman and I, the issues didn't come to a head until 2012 i think when mancuso had meldish beaten uh for the fact that he wouldn't stay away from this woman and back in 2004 or 5 her husband had gone away to prison um a, a, apparently joey relay is a guy that could very easily in the next decade or so become a, a boss or, or an underboss. But back then he was just a young soldier and old uh Tanglewood boy guy. Yeah. Old Tanglewood, uh, Tanglewood boys. And they were going to get Mancuso coming out of it. They knew that he went there every afternoon for lunch and uh, afternoon delight. And they were going to get him coming out of there. They actually put together a hit team. I know PJ Pichotto was part of it. Um, who eventually flipped as well. But uh it's it's interesting how close they got to to killing Mancuso and Mancuso averts that has to go to prison for his role uh, in, in I believe it's the Santoro hit was it the Pizzo- it was either the no, Santoro it was, uh, Pizzolo. it was the Pizzolo hit okay I have 15 it. years confusing him goes away for 15 years but when he's in there he's he's appointed official boss in 2013 and that brings us to we were to where we are today but it's interesting just to kind of look back on that almost 20 years ago and just and, and if fate would have fallen in a different direction, Mikey Mancuso might not be with us right now. And his his run to the to the boss's uh throne might might have been uh or derailed. may have not been with us either. Yeah. So, you know, just keep an eye on on what's going on. I mean, here at the OG podcast, we're, we're we're always on top of this and we're keeping an eye on what's going on in, in uh, New York right now with, with Mikey Mancuso and the Camerano brothers. And I, you know, there's been some speculation, I believe uh, out in the ether about why this isn't being covered by some other people in New York. And uh, all, you know, all I say is I stand by the reporting and I'm confident that at least some of these specifics that I've reported will come out in court documents um, in, in the next six months to a year. So we'll see. Mikey Mancuso right now is on the verge of being sent back to prison for violating his, his supervised release. So I, there's a lot more to be written on that story. But let's uh, let's just change gears as we as we wind down the show and talk a little bit of, about some stuff that is you know non-Italian mafia OC. Uh, let's start talk, to start talking about a couple of things that are, you know, huge headline grabbers in the news right now. Uh, first, the uh, the Gulf Cartel um, is in the news right now for all the wrong reasons. On this side of the border, four Americans were kidnapped last week. Two of them were killed uh, in a, a border city, uh, Texas, uh, the Brownsville, Texas borders. Uh, I don't want to butcher the name. Yeah, and uh, it looks like. The guy that the authorities are holding responsible for this, uh, they call him Lacana. Yeah, so he hasn't been arrested. He's been on the run for a while. There's there's a two and a half million dollar peso reward on him. Essentially, he's from a group called Los Ciclones, which is an armed wing of the Gulf Cartel. Has several armed wings: Los Metros, Los Rojos, Los Ciclones, Grupo Scorpion. They have several, and. The Ciclones are an old offshoot of Tony Tormenta, who was Asiel Cardenas' brother, essentially the godfather of the Gulf Cartel. That was their armed wing. And they have ran Matamoros for years. Um, and he has been known to do this sort of thing recently. There was actually a, a video I tweeted out about two weeks ago where they've done a massive purge of criminals in Matamoros. They kneeled down six uh, buyers and sellers of crystal meth a couple of weeks ago, uh, and they're essentially saying that they're cleansing Matamoros of street crime, whether it's Haitian migrants robbing people. Uh, and they actually talked about they're getting sick and tired of migrants robbing people. And I think what happened here is they assumed these individuals were uh, migrants of some sort, and they were either drug smugglers or robbing people. Uh, and as you know, Scott, down there, it is shoot first, ask questions later. Um, the problem is, I think once they got to the car and several people were hit and this woman screaming that we're Americans, what are you doing? I think they realized we fucked up here pretty quick. And I think they abandoned the ship pretty quick. They have one individual in custody who 
he's just some young kid who was probably lookout and they're going to pin it all on him. Um, but this goes on all the time. I mean, any, any border town has checkpoints um, and you're going to be extorted and, and you're either going to pay or, or, or you're not going to pay and you're going to have a problem. So th- this group's of clonies, they, they've run Matamoros for years. And what I'm very concerned about, and this is something no one's talked about in all this, Osseo Cardenas is going to be released from federal prison in this country yeah, this yeah. year. Yeah. Uh, the truth of the matter is, he ain't going to just go become a chef or something. Yeah, th- this guy was the, you know, the, the linchpin in the, in the growth of that golf cartel. I mean, he was. And uh, is the creator and the yeah. reason. We, we, we look at uh, cartels and the paramilitary level they are now, right? That started with Osiel Cardenas creating La Zetas. Right. So he's a guy who is very powerful. Uh, the golf cartel doesn't get the same respect as like the Sinaloa or Cartel Lisco Nueva Generacion, but they own some very powerful border crossings that make a lot of money. Um, let's talk about how this, you know, dovetails, I guess, with the tour, the tourism industry. I, I'd almost, I don't want to get too into politics here, but I, I'd almost like to see some type of effort by the United States government to, I know you can't tell people not to go vacation in Mexico, but what's the deterrent if if you're Mexico right now to to, to butt or to tighten it up as much as you can? I know that. Well, I, I think the thought of them doing anything about this is it's not going to happen. I mean, no, I know it's not. I know it's not going to happen. I'm just saying uh, what I would but, like to see. I guess what 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 I think you're saying and what what I'm saying is, I mean, we have to remember medical tourism is very big in Mexico. Right, and that's another thing people, people should know about that. That this was, according to the reports, these were people that had gone there for medical tourism, not vacation tourism. Now, I will say, and I and I want to make this very clear because I think with your listeners and with my listeners, I'm very upfront with there are going to be things you may not want to hear that I'm going to put out there. The truth of the matter is, if you look into these individuals that were shot and sadly killed. Um, There is a growing sentiment from what I understand in Mexico from some of the radio broadcasts and some of the TV that these individuals all have drug convictions on their records in this country. In fact, someone involved was someone high level in drug trafficking and they have records Mm -hmm. proving it. So I think the, the growing sentiment is, were they actually there only for a medical procedure? That's the big question. But I think that's the thought because Again, I think it's sad that people have to go down to, you know, dangerous places, whether it's Colombia or, or Mexico, to get some sort of surgery or cancer treatment or whatever. Do I think tourism is big in Matamoros? No. Um, and the truth is, most tourist destinations, Cancun, Tulum, Cabo, Puerto Vallarta, even, are Cabo still no. likely fine as far as as long as you're staying on the resorts. But um, I think it'll hurt it a little bit. I mean, I, I I get questions all the time in DMs. Hey, should I go to a spring break? And it's like, yeah, I would. I probably would. But would I drive through Matamoros into the heart of Mexico to Michoacan or something? No, I wouldn't. I'd yeah. highly recommend only traveling to places you can fly to. I would not drive into anywhere in Mexico. I think that's a bad mistake. Um, so let's just finish off about uh, another big headline grabber, uh, the, the, the Alec Murdoch. Uh, murder trial that just concluded. Uh, Jeff and I talked off uh, uh, off air, and obviously w- we're going to be looking at these angles because of what we do and what we're kind of what our proclivity for this type of research and uh, and reporting is. But I think there's a huge part of this story that's getting lost in the sensationalism uh, surrounding his murdering of his his wife and uh, son. But I think. If you contextualize it, and I was thinking about this today, um, it it might make more sense motive-wise, maybe that's the, not necessarily motive-wise, but what was going through this guy's head uh, to decide to, to kill his, his, his own wife and, and child? Because um, in my opinion, well, first of all, the thing that's getting lost here is that in addition to the murder case, he's facing a drug and racketeering case. Uh, so the the officials in South Carolina are saying that he is a drug trafficker. Um, but 
beyond that, I, what my limited research has told me, and I've, I've been getting fed information about this case for, I would say six months. And honestly, I don't know if I was doing my due diligence um, at first. I didn't really know the case that well. And I dismissed it as, you know, domestic disturbances. And the more I learned about the case and the more I started to go um, reach back out to the people that had been trying to feed me information, this kind of new narrative started to formulate, at least in my research, that I think will eventually come out, you know, in, in, in court cases coming down the pike here. I, my opinion here is that Alex Murdaugh around 10 years ago, well, maybe a little bit longer, broke bad, you know, did a Walter White uh, and stopped being a legitimate attorney that might have had some moral and ethical shortcomings and decided he was going to be a gangster. Um, and if you're a gangster, and, and I don't think it's a coincidence that these, besides his wife and his kid, you have these other incidents that happened in 2015 and then in 2018 uh, where people end up dead. These weren't happening earlier in his life. Uh, so I, I think he felt the more criminality he was involved in, the more emboldened he felt, the more empowered he felt. So I think I, it's, I, I think yeah, it's possible. It's and I think what you're saying is that in a way he accepted crime. He was willing to protect himself from people finding out about that crime. And he was willing to do whatever he had to do to get to it. And he felt emboldened because he knew that in the end, he was part of a powerful family and it'd be very hard to prove that he was a part of it. And you, you mentioned some of the, the crimes that have not been solved. For instance, the 2015 murder of, of Stephen Smith. It was a murder. It wasn't an accident. It was a murder. Someone killed the kid. Um, the thought is, was that Alex Murdoch? Possibly. Maybe he finds that his son's a homosexual. He doesn't want to live with that. Maybe he finds that maybe he's maybe he's having relations with the kid. We don't really know. Um, th this is such a weird web, tangled web of a guy, as you said, who had this prominence. I mean, his family goes back to the hundred years. Yeah. And they controlled both sides. The, the fact that there weren't more people asking questions about the Murdoch's were, uh, were controlling both sides of the law in Hampton County. They were the prosecutors and they were the, the area's biggest defense attorneys. When I don't know if you know, all the, also is his grandfather, Alex Murdoch's grandfather, was indicted in a federal. Um, bootlegging case where yeah. he was providing information to moonshine uh moonshiners and he somehow skated out of it uh and it was it was it was relieved and beat the rap but yeah the the as you reported i mean you're you're putting out some really interesting stuff with his relation to street gangs through his yeah this cousin eddie character and this is have that you know this isn't like speculation because at least in terms of allegations, this is popping up in court files, federal court files. Um, what I reported was that the government is is contending that Murdoch and his this hillbilly co-conspirator, alleged co-conspirator of his uh, cousin Eddie Smith, um, in addition to them being drug kingpins i mean there there's allegations that they were or at a certain point they were controlling all the drugs that were going through both hampton and, and, Col and, Con and counties this uh, so-called low country uh, region but i've been told that there was also a prostitution ring um and a some form of of, of uh, sports gambling uh business book bookmaking uh, sporting events, but also uh, having like backdoor casinos and um, at Mo Moselle. Num numbers. What were we saying, Jeff? At Moselle. The right, at this Moselle property. Uh, and I think that's all eventually going to come out. And that there was a direct tie into the most dangerous, most notorious African American criminal organization in that area known as the uh, Walter Burrow Cowboys. Um, just recently or in the last couple of months, uh, two affiliates of the, of those, of the Cowboys group were indicted while 
Murdaugh wasn't indicted with them. He's him and Smith come up in the indictment as the fact that these two guys were helped, according to the, this indictment, were helping Smith and Murdaugh launder money. One of these guys is first cousins and next door neighbors with the boss of the uh, uh, Cowboys, a guy named Kiri Broughton who goes by K Black and is a 30 in his early to mid 30s right now. And it's going to be getting out of prison next year. Um, but, you know, you kind of have to play connect the dots yourself. And it ain't that big of a jump to get from this Kerry Broughton, who was the biggest African-American crime lord in in um, these two counties, and then make the direct line to, to Alex Murdoch. And also remember, okay, in several of the documentaries put out, there's a lot of foreshadowing in the fact that it's very clear that not only Buster Murdoch, but Alex Murdoch are very interested in gambling. They talk about okay. gambling on the prison telephone, as well as the fact that at one point we find out that Moselle has some sort of airport, like this right. runway. where Which is what some very- of the information that I was getting, right. and it was alluded to on the Netflix thing, and it comes up in the, the these these two uh, cowboy affiliates uh, in the case files. Do you buy, I mean, I, I'm just going to say it, okay? Do you buy the the oxycodone addiction? Because I don't. I don't buy it at all. Here's what I, I don't think he's. I don't think he's addicted to any drug. I mean, I think no one could the, do that amount of narcotics and survive. I think the entire narrative that he was broke is false. I think yeah. he was broke in the sense that he couldn't show legitimate income. But, but I don't not think living, he was, uh, without I meals. Think he was making a lot of money in this other. Well, so I think another thing that people should know that played a role in the into what I have categorized as him breaking bad was I think he was as you know he was a guy that had no problem pushing the envelope like I said morally and ethically but I don't think he was ever a full-fledged criminal until the last 10 years where if you read what's been chronicled and is, is well known he took some real big financial hits uh, in the late 2000s a lot of money he had in, in real estate deals. Uh, that fell through, and they say that this is what led to him, you know, stealing from his clients. And so, and I'm not doubting that, but I think there's a lot more to the story there. And I think he fully kind of pivoted um, to financing his life through other means, uh, and you know, that led to where we are today. But. Uh, and that I, could I, possibly be why he killed his wife and son. Yeah. So, because they were trying to unearth the fact that. Well, she he, was divorced. She was going to divorce him. And he didn't. I think it's clear that he had a disappointment in his younger son. Yeah. And you look at the one son. Why, if he's going to kill the whole family, why, why didn't he kill the whole family? Why right. didn't he kill the other son? You know, because he's and then the, just the the sheer the sheer arrogance, um, and, and on multiple levels of of this layers of this, and yeah, it comes from having a family that's controlled that area for a hundred years and being able. He's fifty four years old right now, so for the first half century of his life, uh, if not more, he's been able to do whatever he wants and get away with it. But to me, like the fact that this guy could, it, in his mind, think that he could meet the police and the day that this happens and he looks crispy clean and in 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 the interview he's like yeah i i grabbed them and i tried to give them cpr and i try to take their pulse and these bodies are just you know torn apart by these guns carnage is everywhere and he's meeting the he's got a white t-shirt on and and khaki shorts on and it, like he looks like he just walked out of a fashion shoot, and and he's trying to convince them that that he was holding his son before he died and took his pulse, and none of that made any sense. I will admit though, he's quite the actor in the phone yeah. call. Um, you know, just the way he acted. I mean, you would have thought um, that he had just walked in and found his son and wife dead. I mean, it, it's the acting job he put on was quite good. Could you? I mean, let me ask you this: Could you? Could you have not acknowledged that you lied on that? Um, you know, they found his voice 
on a, on the Snapchat. On a, on a, on a Snapchat and he acknowledged that he had lied. Could he have just stuck to that lie? And maybe they could have brought up some. I would have just said it wasn't. How can you prove that was me? Like, right. Well, see, that's why I'm saying. So then he, there's, he had no business taking the stand. I mean, no, there's zero, there's that. zero physical evidence tying this guy to this crime. That's what I'm saying. I didn't if get it. I'm anymore. his defense attorney. I'm like, I'm going to pull myself off the case if, if you, you insist on testifying. Because the only way you have a chance of walking here is if you don't get on the stand. I so, thought every time he opened his mouth, he screwed himself. Right. And, and he it, did it even, even at the end. I did not kill my wife and son, yeah. Paul Paul. You know, like it, just anytime he opened his mouth, he just could not say anything that wasn't going to make him look real bad. I agree. I think he should have, could have beat the rap. I think he could have denied. And it's weird because he continues to deny that he did do this. Why admit, hey, oh yeah, I actually, I actually was there. I'm sorry I lied. I mean, that's right. That leads to doubt. And, and then before you know it, you're fried. And I think from, again, from my limited research here, uh, I talked to a couple people down there who told me about, what his reputation was before any of this started to bubble to the surface. Um, and at least in the legal community, he was known as, a, as lazy and entitled, but he was also known as someone that was a great orator in front of the jury, that he was legendary for these uh, very passionate, emotional uh, closing arguments. So he, in my opinion, he obviously thought that he could jump on the stand and, and channel that and charm the jury. To me, and this is the last thing I'll say about it, and then we'll wrap up, to, to parallel it to another traditional organized crime case that I covered, where I almost saw the exact same thing happen, and it killed him too, was Joey the Clown Lombardo in the Family Secrets trial. And I covered that trial as my first, I was making my bones as a reporter back in 2007. And uh, Lombardo, it was a four month trial. And the first two and a half months, three months of the trial, he was coming off so great. There was no physical evidence tying this guy to the murder that he was charged with. It was 40 years before that. He's charming the jury every time he's in, he's in the, the courtroom because his little quirky grandpa act is playing in very small doses. But he got arrogant and thought that he could jump on the stand for three days and that grandpa, you know, that funny grandpa act would somehow neutralize him lying. And it was just a disaster. He got on the stand and that, that the whole the whole rapport he had with the jury melted away in a matter of minutes. There's probably one thing you don't want to do. If you commit a crime and you're definitely guilty, you probably shouldn't get on the stand. If now, there's, there's no physical evidence. Yeah, if there's you didn't, zero physical evidence. If you didn't do it and you have nothing to hide. Yeah, if you didn't do it and have nothing to hide, I would definitely go on the stand. Because you can, you can when you've, you're telling the truth, you can have a lot of conviction in what you're saying. It's very few people on the planet that can lie that good, right? If they did something. Yeah, Alex just, Murdoch can't do it. And he... You're right. He should have never been anywhere near the stand. Well, Jeff, uh, this was awesome, dude. Let people know uh, where they can find you. And uh, obviously everyone knows about Barstool, but let everyone, you know, give them all your, uh, your information. Yeah. You can find me uh, on the sit down. Uh, you can search it on YouTube. It comes up quite easily. I have a podcast, same name, iTunes, Spotify, Google pods, um, you know, mainly mafia content, but I, I do do a lot of cartel stuff and I try to interview interesting people. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we kind of you and I go in lieu of kind of a lot of different things. We kind of talk about a lot of the same things. But, you know, there are things that, that I may do that you don't do or vice versa. So, um, yeah, you know, you're one of my favorite people as always. I always appreciate coming on here. And uh, you know, you've been on my show a couple of times. You know, it's funny. I get people all the time. You need to do something on Detroit or, or something. So I'm sure we'll have you on again soon. And, uh, yeah, as always, thanks for having me, Scott. Let them know about the uh, the sports gambling part too, because Jeff, I mean, I'm not yeah. blowing smoke up his ass. Like I in terms of ha handicappers in in that space, Jeff's yeah. at the you know the top of the mountain. Yeah, I'll just kind of tell people I have uh, some stuff coming out next week with college hoops. I got a new show starting on Monday um, involving several of my coworkers. Um, you know, I write a lot of blogs, do a lot of shows. I post them on my Twitter account at Jeff Nadeau. Um, 
you know, and I really just kind of leave myself out there to, to help anybody that needs an answer on something, whether it's a game or, a, or something. Um, I'm ready for the season to end. It's been a long season, but, uh, you know, once you get to this point, Scott, I mean, as you know, like I gamble from September when college football starts yeah. till mid April when, when hoops ends, it's a long, uh, it's a it's, long, run. it's a long haul. Yeah. But, uh, I, I think, uh, there's a, there's a beautiful future between the OG and the sit down. Um, we love, uh, combining forces to give great content and Jeff, you, you, you bring the thunder every time that uh, you come on here, man. Well, I think you and I are passionate about this thing. And it's rare. I, I know in the mob space, it's very rare outside of the people that were in that world to find folks that A, know what they're talking about and B, have a passion for it. Because if you have a passion for something, you're going to put a lot of time into it. And I know you do. And, and I try to as well. And I, I know for me, I have some ideas and I've kind of run them by you. So yeah. I think you know, we're kind of in a way of the future. So I, I appreciate you always. In terms, you know, in terms of your Detroit reporting, I mean, or not your Detroit reporting, but in terms of anything that would be, you know, interesting yeah. to your audience in, in kind of real time here, you know, uh, and we could definitely do something on this if you're interested. You know, Michael Francis, uh, the, the famous mafia prince, uh, came to town last week and uh, met with the FBI and was doing interviews um, on, on local media stations around here telling everybody he was meeting with the FBI uh, to give them his insight on, on the Jimmy Hoffa case. So, you know, we'll see where that goes. I, I don't put a lot of weight in it. I, I will say one thing as we end on Michael. Um, I don't know who runs his shop. Oh, he's great. He's, he's the Cadillac. His, he's the Ivy League of the shit. Yeah, whoever does that is really good. I mean, because you oh, look at him compared to I'm not going to bring his name up. The other guy that has a big channel. Yeah. I mean, it's night and day as far as what they do, what they're told to do, uh, what they shouldn't be doing that they are doing. I mean, he he's very good with that. He has a lot of people strong around him that put him in good spots. So he's got this thing down to a science and, and I'm not trying, he, he his heart's in the right place. I'm, I don't want it to come off. And I talked to him about this when he came in town. I'm not, I don't want to, it to sound like I'm trying to dismiss or marginalize um, him wanting to contribute. And I know that just like a lot of these people, even if what they're coming to, to say isn't true, they believe in their heart of hearts that it needs to be told. Um, so as long as there's not someone out and there have been people like this too, out trying to con you, well, I've, on my channel, Mike, Mike's like, not trying to count anybody. He believes that someone told him that he trusts that know that he thinks knows this, and he's passing the information on, on my channel. The sit down that's something I try to do. I try to out these charlatans that come into this genre and pretend that they were, you know, Anthony or uh, Lu, or Lucky Luciano's nephew and and and, and those kind of people. I'm just not going to allow it. And uh, you got to police it a little bit. But yeah, Michael is is got a good thing he's doing, and and. I don't know what he knows about the Jimmy Hoffa hit, but well, hey, that's what I'm saying. Like, know. I'm not trying to like be dismissive of it, saying like, "Oh, what does Mike Francis know about Jimmy Hoffa? He was a Colombo." That's kind of how I feel, but at the same time, I'm saying it's sincere, and he's trying to help the family get cl have closure. I don't think that you know he looks at this as a long shot. He looks at this as legitimate information that he wants to pass on. So why should I sit there and judge him because it's coming from the Columbos and not from the Genovese or come, you know? So anyway, it's something that maybe we could talk about in the future. Jeff, when thanks a lot some, for joining us. When uh, that Jimmy will be back next uh, week. Figured it out. Yeah. Uh, so Jeff Nadu, uh, sit down podcast, Scott Bernstein, OG podcast. Thank you to Ben behind the glass for producing. Jimmy will be back next week. Scott Bernstein for Mr. Nadu and Benny, the producer. We're out.